What's up today guys? We have a video today, BiPAP versus CPAP. I'm going to give you a bunch of pictures. They may be poorly drawn, but let's get to it. about CPAP first. It's an acronym. C P A P. Continuous positive airway pressure. So con one pressure continuously. The best way to really to show it is going to be here with a pressure time waveform. And let's say we have this set up at 5, 10, 15 centimeters of water pressure. We set them on a CPAP of 5. This is pretty low. CPAP of 5. The waveform is going to look something like this. You see this constant pressure is maintained. These little pieces right here, those are act those little dips are actually the patient actuating their own breath. But during that time, they're going to continue to get this CPAP. CPAP actually does a, a bunch of different things, but mainly it's going to be used for two main things. Number one, OSA, obstructive sleep apnea. So it's going to split somebody's airways when they're sleeping, they go into rib sleep, their airways get loose, floppy. It's going to split those open with this continuous pressure. Another thing it's going to affect is oxygenation. So it can recruit alveoli. So adding CPAP to somebody who's spontaneously breathing but is having oxygenation issues without ventilatory, without a ventilatory factor, this can really help to increase the pressure inside the alveoli and recruit some that might be atelectatic. So CPAP is used for both of those different things. It's usually one pressure. Starting pressures on most people is gonna, are gonna be from eight to maybe 12 is where we're gonna start out. If, if you've ever had a sleep study before, and you would know if you had one because uh, it's something you don't forget, but they'll actually lay you down, put some EEGs on your head, put a flow monitor on your nose, and a movement monitor on your chest, and they're gonna monitor how your chest excursion is going with the airflow at your nose and what what uh, what level of sleep you're in, what stage of sleep you're in. So they're going to monitor, they're going to look for chest movement with may possibly lack of airflow, which means there's an obstruction somewhere. So that's going to mean they need to add some CPAP. They'll continuously add a CPAP, so your number might be 6, and that's enough to keep you open, or it might be 12, or it might be 18 to keep your airways open, but everybody's number is different. Don't just judge a book by its cover and see some big guy and say he's got to be a 15. Because I've seen older ladies who are super high. It's just, it's just what it takes to hold their airways open when they're in the deepest part of sleep. So that's obstructive sleep apnea. That's what it's used for. Oxygenation purposes, of course, anytime you have alveoli, you're going to have some really good ones. You're going to have some that aren't so good. So we're going to have some that are large, nice, functional. This one's probably too large over and unfunctional, dysfunctional. And then we have some that are maybe atelectatic. So we're going to have some that are kind of collapsed. Adding that pressure in is going to help to recruit alveoli. Because like it or not, alveoli are just not connected to the main airways by this tube. There's actually different pores, pores of con and whatnot, that, that are kind of uh, connect alveoli to one another. So if you recruit one alveoli, you can recruit some other ones attached to it, which is really great. Recruiting alveoli is adding your area of oxygenation and increasing that. That's what CPAP does. So, two main things. OSA and straight oxygenation also can be used really um, efficiently for congestive heart failure without a ventilatory component. So if they have fluid in these alveoli, it can help to push pressure down into here, offset that pressure of the fluid coming from the vessels in, and actually push the fluid back into the vessels recruit some alveoli and then we can dump that fluid off through some kind of diuresis type process. So CPAP works really well in those cases. <clears throat> One pressure, oxygenation, and OSA. Let's go now, to BiPAP. BiPAP is the brand name for what we call NIPPV. So BiPAP, B-I-P-A-P -P, is used very widely. Bi for two and this is positive airway pressure. So we have two positive airway pressures, an IPAP and an EPAP. Better documented as the term NIPPV. So I've heard it called NIPV before also, but this is non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So this is not through an endotracheal tube or a trach, this is non-invasive through a mask, but we are doing positive pressure ventilation. 
Let me kind of show you how this works. So first of all, we're going to have an IPAP and an EPAP. So we love the acronyms in respiratory care, and you're going to notice that. So inspiratory, positive airway pressure, expiratory, positive airway pressure. So we're going to have two numbers we're going to use there. Let's just say generically we're going to start at 12 centimeters of water up here and 6 centimeters of water here. Now these are just kind of generic settings. So 6 and 12. Let me show you what it looks like on a waveform. So over time we have pressure and we have time. So let's see, uh, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. 6, 9, 12, 15. So let's just show it this way. With a BiPAP, the pressure waveform is going to look a little bit different. Now, the best definition of it, of NIPPV, is it augments the patient's spontaneous tidal volume. Okay, so this is not to augment somebody's rate. The respiratory rate is low, they need a ventilator, an invasive ventilator. You take off the N off this. IPPV, we can do whatever you want to call it, but they need a tube in. If you need to help with the rate, you don't use a BiPAP. But a BiPAP or NIPPV is used for augmenting somebody's own spontaneous tidal volume. So they have to have an adequate respiratory rate. They got to have an effort to do this. But we're going to augment that and we're going to assist their rate, give them a larger volume, and get rid of CO2. So, IPAP of 12, EPAP of 6. So we're going to run along our EPAP. You're going to see a little dip, which is this dude right here. That's a trigger as the patient's starting to breath. It's going to sense that. It's going to go up and then come down. Trigger, go up and come down. Longer, longer, longer. No trigger. Go up and come down. You see that's a little bit different there. Because with, with the NIPPV, you can actually have triggered breaths or time breaths. They are absolutely not ideal. Because how would it feel if you were sitting there with a the mask reading a magazine and all of a sudden... Maybe you just didn't take a breath, but the machine said, here, take this breath, Boosh, and blast you with some flow. You're going to be like, what the heck? And it really decreases the amount of um, patient comfort, and it's all about how you present it to the patient, and it's also about you know, their um, level of <clears throat> compliance once you get it on. So we really don't want to be blasting them with random breaths every once in a while. We want them to take their own breaths, let the machine finish it for them. So in this case, you're going to see you're starting at 6, you're going up to 12. So 12 and this is 6. Patient started each time. So the best way you want to think about this pressure, the scalar waveform is this area right down here is where we're oxygenating the patient. This area right here is where we're ventilating the patient. So oxygenation is O2, ventilation is CO2. So that's how you're going to work on your blood gas in these cases. So if you get a blood gas and the CO2 is high, um, what you can do in high and or acidotic, you can take this 12 and turn it up maybe to 14. Turn up to 14, then it's going to be a little bit taller. You have more area for ventilation, and that's going to help. Let's say your oxygenation is really bad. So you've messed your with your FiO2, you got it to where really, honestly, about 60% is where the cutoff is. After 60%, uh, you really need to start thinking about something physical physiologically, changing something physiologically, uh, then adding more FiO2 because you're kind of on that that top side of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. So you, you really need to start thinking about it at 60%. So oxygenation issues, maybe we would take this bottom number here, this six maybe up to eight. So we could bump this up to eight. It's going to add for more oxygenation space. But we have to in turn keep the same space between your IPAP and your EPAP. So that space in between these two, like in this case, it's six between 12 and six. That's your space of ventilation. If you add, increase your bottom, you got to increase your top two. If you're having problems with oxygenation and ventilation, then you increase the bottom by two and then increase the top by four. So you're going to take the whole thing up and then take the top up even higher. So that's extreme cases. And if you're messing with that, you probably maybe should tube them anyway. So and that's basic management with a BiPAP. Now, you don't go in here and turn up their respiratory rate. <clears throat> Think about this backup rate. It's, a, it's really, respiratory rate is really a BR, backup rate. So let's say we have it set at 8, which is not normal respiratory rate, but if they were apneic, it would alarm. So let's say it's at 8. 
So if their CO2 is high on their blood gas, you won't want to go in and be like, hey, let's just turn this BR up to 20. Well, that's a breath like every three seconds. So that is like pretty much constant on this patient. So nothing you want to do. Remember, we're not messing with rate when it comes to a BiPAP. What does a BiPAP do? Two different things. And this is why it's so helpful for our patients. For one, it helps ventilation. So this is our COPD patient that's having uh, ventilatory issues. We don't want to put on a ventilator right now. This is also a patient that might have hypoventilate at night or during a nap. This is a really good thing for them. CPAP is not going to help them. They need the ventilatory aspect, the fluctuation in the pressure. When I walk in a room and I see one of these units, most units can do CPAP or BiPAP. You walk in and you hear the, the air fluctuating. Shh. That's BiPAP. If you hear one constant, shh, 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 that's usually CPAP. Before I even look at the machine, I know that. So when you're documenting this, CPAP's gonna have one pressure, BiPAP's gonna have two pressures, and then another thing you're gonna have is your FiO2. So that's really important in looking at your stability of your patient. FiO2's on BiPAP or CPAP greater than 40 or 50, the patient is not stable, oxygenation-wise. These are the ones you gotta watch, because usually you might, take that mask off or they may take it off themselves, they'll de-recruit alveoli and their saturations might drop quickly. 40 and 50 on FiO2. So you're not really looking at pressures. If you're looking at your stability of your patient, especially if you're a nurse taking a BiPAP or a CPAP, you're looking at how much oxygen do they have going in. Because that's going to tell me about their oxygenation status and kind of their overall respiratory status. It's going to give you a really good idea. Like if this thing alarms, is this the one I'm going to go running for or just the one I'm going to walk fast towards? So you got to really know that when you look at that. Uh, BiPAP also can be used to help push down fluid, of course, a CHF. Uh, BiPAP, you know, classically is a little bit easier to get used to if you're a patient. That fluctuation, and, and there's one real key to teaching somebody about this, and I've, I've always told people this, and it's kind of worked for me when I've taught patients how to wear a BiPAP, so I would get the mask on them and I will tell the patient, I'll say, you start the breath, let the machine finish the breath. So don't have the patient thinking, they gotta take this whole breath in each time. Let them start the breath, let the machine finish it. And it actually takes a lot of work off of their body because unless you've been in an exacerbation, you don't know how much work they're actually going through all the sternocleidal mastoid muscles, every bit, every muscle in their chest they're using to breathe each time. Having this extra flow going in is really important to take down that work of breathing to get them to rest a little bit. Because if you don't rest, you're gonna wear out. You wear out, you might be intubated on a ventilator. So, BiPAP, NIPPV, that works really well for getting rid of, using oxygenation and getting rid of CO2. So we're gonna do both of them with it. So that's why you're gonna see it commonly used more. But there are definitely times when you can just use CPAP. Uh, if you have a patient who has OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, and they can't tolerate a CPAP, they may be on BiPAP for that just because it's all about patient compliance. Central sleep apnea is a different story. So CSA, central sleep apnea is it's an issue at your brainstem level that stops you from breathing. It's not an obstruction, so in that case, they will have a BiPAP with a backup rate to kind of be like, hey, hey buddy, wake up, breathe, you're not breathing. So you find that out when you have a sleep study. But that's the best that I could do for comparing CPAP to BiPAP. Thanks for watching.